Good morning, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Abbott's third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of this call. During the question and answer session, you will be able to ask your question by pressing the star 11 keys on your touchtone phone. This call is being recorded by Abbott. With the exception of any participants' questions asked during the question and answer session, the entire call, including the question and answer session, is material copyrighted by Abbott. It cannot be recorded or rebroadcast without Abbott's express written permission. I would now like to introduce Mr. Mike Camilla, Vice President, Investor Relations. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. With me today are Robert Ford, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Bob Funk, Executive Vice President Finance, and Phil Boudreau, Senior Vice President Finance and Chief Financial Officer. Robert and Phil will provide opening remarks. Following their comments, we'll take your questions. Before we get started, some statements made today may be forward-looking for purposes of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, including the expected financial results for 2023. Abbott cautions that these forward-looking statements are subject to risk and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated in the forward-looking statements. Economic, competitive, governmental, technological, and other factors that may affect Abbott's operations are discussed in Item 1A, Risk Factors, to our annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2022. Abbott undertakes no obligation to release publicly any revisions to forward-looking statements as a result of subsequent events or developments, except as required by law. On today's conference call, as in the past, non-GAAP financial measures will be used to help investors understand Abbott's ongoing business performance. These non-GAAP financial measures are reconciled with the comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings news release and regulatory filings from today, which are available on our website at abbott.com. Note that Abbott has not provided the GAAP financial measure for organic sales growth on a forward-looking basis because the company is unable to predict future changes in foreign exchange rates, which could impact reported sales growth. Unless otherwise noted, our commentary on sales growth refers to organic sales growth, which is defined in the quarterly results press release issued earlier today. With that, I will now turn the call over to Robert. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we reported third quarter adjusted earnings per share of $1.14. Based on our performance through the first nine months of the year, we raised the midpoint of our full year adjusted earnings per share guidance and narrowed the range to $4.42 to $4.46. Organic sales growth on the base business, which excludes COVID testing, increased double digits for the third consecutive quarter and was led by double digit growth in all four of our major businesses. This acceleration in sales growth is a result of our strong position in attractive growth markets in conjunction with the additional investments we made across the company during the pandemic. In addition to the strong top-line performance, we continue to deliver accelerating earnings power on our base business and remain on track to deliver on the financial commitments we set at the beginning of the year. With a positive growth outlook for the businesses and the momentum we're building across the portfolio, we are well positioned for a strong finish to the year and heading into 2024. I will now review our performance in more detail before turning the call over to Phil. I'll start with nutrition, where sales increased 18% in the quarter. In pediatric nutrition, growth of 25% was led by continued market share capture in the U.S. infant formula business, where we have now reclaimed the leadership position. Internationally, we continue to deliver well-balanced growth coming from both infant formula products 
and our PediaSure toddler brand. In adult nutrition, growth of 12% was driven by strong demand for Abbott's market-leading Ensure and Lucerna brands across the U.S. and international markets. Turning to established pharmaceuticals, sales increased 11% in the quarter. This strong performance was broad-based and led by double-digit growth in several markets and therapeutic areas, including cardiometabolic, women's health, and CNS pain management. In September, we announced an agreement with global biotech leader Mab Science to commercialize several biosimilars in emerging markets. This collaboration will help introduce cutting-edge medicines in the areas of oncology, women's health, and respiratory diseases to people in countries that have historically lacked access to these treatment options. Moving to diagnostics, excluding COVID testing, organic sales grew 10%, led by core lab diagnostics, where sales grew double digits, driven by above market performance in the US and internationally. Growth was driven by a continued increase in global demand for routine diagnostic testing and a strong recovery of our blood transfusion testing business following a period of lower plasma donations that occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. In rapid diagnostics, double-digit organic sales growth on the base business benefited from increased demand for respiratory tests in anticipation of an earlier than normal start to the flu season in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'll wrap up with medical devices, where sales grew nearly 15%, including double-digit growth in both the U.S. and internationally. In diabetes care, Freestyle Libre sales were $1.4 billion in the quarter and grew 28%. The global Libre user base now exceeds 5 million people, with nearly 2 million of those in the U.S., where the Libre user base has nearly doubled in the last two years. A recent analysis of our U.S. user base showed that a growing number of Libre users are using Libre in combination with GLP-1 medications as part of a companion therapy approach for managing their diabetes. On average, those using both Libre and AGLP-1 exhibited a higher rate of use for both products, wearing Libre sensors more often and taking GLP-1 medication more frequently compared to other users. This increase in use or better compliance is a positive sign that these users are taking an even more active role in managing their diabetes. And while we traditionally think of therapy choices as having to compete against one another, this is a good example of a complementary relationship between two products that both help optimize the treatment of diabetes. In cardiovascular devices, sales grew 10% overall in the quarter, led by double-digit growth in electrophysiology and structural heart. In electrophysiology, sales growth of 17% was driven by double-digit growth across all major international geographic regions and high teens growth of ablation catheters in the U.S. In structural heart, performance was driven by double-digit growth of MitraClip and strong growth from several recently launched new products, most notably Navitor, our latest generation Tavra valve. In rhythm management, growth was led by double-digit growth in pacemaker sales, led by Aver, our recently launched leadless pacemaker that can be used for both single-chamber and dual-chamber pacing. And lastly, in neuromodulation, sales grew 19%, driven by the recent launch of Eterna, our first rechargeable neurostimulation device for pain management, which targets a large segment of the market where we previously did not compete. So in summary, this was a very strong quarter with all four major businesses delivering double-digit organic sales growth, excluding COVID testing-related sales. 
Growth rates in the base business have improved every quarter this year on both the top and bottom lines. And the momentum we are building positions us well, positions us well for a strong finish to the year and heading into 2024. I'll now turn over the call to Phil. Phil. Thanks, Robert. As Mike mentioned earlier, please note that all references to sales growth rates, unless otherwise noted, are on an organic basis. Turning to our third quarter results, sales decreased 1.5% on an organic basis due to, as expected, a year-over-year -year decline in COVID testing-related sales. Excluded COVID-tested sales, underlying base business organic sales growth was 13.8% in the quarter. Foreign exchange had an unfavorable year-over-year -year impact of 1.4% on third quarter sales. During the quarter, we saw the U.S. dollar strengthen somewhat versus several currencies, which resulted in a slightly more unfavorable impact on sales compared to exchange rates at the time of our earnings call in July. Regarding other aspects of the P&L, the adjusted gross margin ratio was 55% of sales. On a year-to-date basis, our adjusted gross margin ratio is 55.4% of sales, which is below our original full-year guidance of approximately 56% that we provided back in January. The difference is primarily due to lower gross margins on COVID tests due to lower volumes and price compared to our original forecast assumptions, and the impact of higher inventory obsolescence as a result of maintaining higher inventory levels throughout the pandemic to help ensure product supply during a time when global supply chains were less predictable. As the global supply chain environment continues to improve, we're adjusting our inventory levels to align with that trend. Adjusted R&D was 6.2% of sales and adjusted SG&A was 26.4% of sales in the third quarter. Lastly, our third quarter adjusted tax rate was 14%. Turning to our 2023 outlook, for the full year, we now forecast ongoing earnings per share of $4.42 to $4.46, which is comprised of our year-to-date results plus ongoing earnings per share guidance of $1.17 to $1.21 for the fourth quarter. For the fourth quarter, we forecast total underlying base business organic sales growth, excluding COVID testing sales, to be in the low double digits and exchange to have an unfavorable impact of a little more than 1% on fourth quarter reported sales. With that, we'll now open the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, we will conduct the question and answer session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising you that your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. For optimal sound quality, we kindly ask that you please use your handset instead of your speakerphone when asking your question. And again, that's star 11 to ask a question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question will come from Josh Jennings from TD Cowan. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the questions and congratulations on a, another strong quarter. Uh, Robert, uh, organic revenue growth nearly touched the mid-teens range for the core business in, in 3Q. And I realize we, we recently talked about the sustainability of the momentum generated this year, but I think investors would like to hear about um, your confidence level in the core business delivering high single-digit organic revenue growth and, and solid margin expansion in 2024 off the 2023 comp that's only moved higher over the course of this year. Thanks for taking the question. Sure, Josh. Um, I mean, the confidence level is uh, is very high, uh, especially with this kind of momentum uh, that we're seeing. Um, clearly, there's going to be some macro environment challenges uh, as companies head into 2024. Uh, but I'd say our portfolio has really been built to withstand this type of uh, environment, and we tend to do pretty well uh, in this type of environment. And, and as I said in, in in my comments, also we've we've further strengthened. Uh, the portfolio and the position that we had uh, with the investments that we made during the pandemic, and that's helped lead to a step up here in our growth rate this year. You know, the base business has, has grown double digits three quarters in a row, and uh, I expect to be doing that again uh, in Q4. And if you look at the EPS contribution, 
um, as I said in the comments, uh, it's really uh, having a, a positive impact uh, and, and a lot of power coming through uh, on the base business um, as we've continued to grow that. And it's sequentially gotten better every quarter. Uh, so we're forecasting another step up in the fourth quarter. So if you look at that EPS uh, for the fourth quarter um, and, and put it all together, the, the base business here is going to contribute to about $4.10 of EPS. Uh, and you know we've raised that uh, twice this year, so uh, there's clearly momentum uh, that's building here, both in the top and the bottom lines. And, and I believe that momentum is going to sustain and continue as we go into 2024. I think it starts, uh, Josh, always with a top line, uh, and if you can drive uh, higher top line growth, I think that's really the the, the, the building block. And if you look at our pan, uh, let's say our pre-pandemic, uh, you know, kind of growth. Uh, formula here, we were growing around 7%. So I expect, I expect that to accelerate um, in, uh, in next year, um, without a doubt. And <clears throat> and that's off a, a much larger uh, sales base than we were pre-pandemic. And like I said, that's based off the momentum that we're seeing and uh, increased contributions that we'll be seeing from a lot of our growth drivers that I'm sure we'll be talking about um, um, throughout the call. The street models double-digit EPS uh, on the base business right now, and uh, I feel real good uh, about our, our ability to deliver that. Uh, obviously, a lot of focus um, is going to come from gross margin and, and, and gross margin expansion, uh, and I think we've got uh, momentum and tailwind here as, as, we, as we're going to go into, uh, into 2024. So uh, when, we go to, when we go to our, uh, our call in January, I'll be able to kind of quantify that and give you better ranges and all of that. But I'd say uh, it really, it's really about reiterating and reinforcing um, our, you know, our growth model, uh, our growth framework, which is you know, high, high single-digit revenue growth, double-digit bottom line growth, margin expansion, strong free cash flow generation, and a, and a balanced uh, capital uh, allocation strategy. So, uh, again, I feel very good about sustaining this momentum going into going into, into next year. Understood. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And our next question will come from Larry Beagleson from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Just, just to be clear, it's uh, uh, Wells Fargo. But uh, uh, good morning, Robert. Um, uh, we know who you are, Larry. Quarter here. Okay, good. So, so Robert, China has been in the news a lot. Um, love to hear your thoughts. You know, on how you're thinking about China, big picture. Um, how, how is Q3, and you know, what are you expecting from the VPP impact in the EP business, and, and from the anti-corruption uh, initiatives we've been hearing about there? Thanks for taking the question. Sure. Uh, well, China uh, has been and will continue to be an important market for us. Uh, as it relates to, you know, I think this theme on, uh, on this anti-corruption uh, uh, discussion points there, listen, we've been operating in China for, for 35 years. We follow our compliance standards, uh, follow all applicable laws. I didn't see uh, any kind of meaningful impact in, in, in Q3, uh, Larry. I was actually there last week and uh, had a chance to meet with the teams and go through the businesses and uh, didn't really see uh, any, any meaningful impact. Uh, devices grew 20% in the quarter, so I think uh, uh, that's, um, you know, we'll, we'll just have to keep on monitoring that situation, but, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see any uh, real impact uh, in the quarter. Uh, as, it relate, as it relates to VBP, listen, this is, um, you know, this is a term that's used for, for China, but I think it's, a, it's just a common theme that we see across, you know, across the world with governments trying to, you know, trying to provide the care to their populations and, and, and manage their budgets. So I don't think this is anything uh, you know, completely extraordinary than what we've seen. Um, the, there was a VBP on, on the EP business. Uh, that process started earlier uh, earlier this year in April. I'd say about 80% of the market uh, has now been implemented, um, and uh, I expect the remainder of that to uh, to be implemented um, uh, by year end. Yeah, there's a little bit of a price impact that we felt, but uh, net net, it was uh, positive for our EP business uh, in um, um, in in China because we were able to pick up share. And pick up volume, so uh, so I think that's uh, uh, that's the status there. Um, I think there's 
announced a, a VBP uh, on diagnostics. Uh, that's not unexpected either. Um, I think the process will start um, sometime uh, in the first half of, uh, of next year. Um, right now, from the list of products that we've seen, it involves about 20% of our core lab business. Um, and then as we've seen with uh, businesses that have, uh, you know, capital and service tied to it, you know, the rollout is a little bit different uh, from the rollout that you see on a, what I would call more pure consumables. Uh, so it's more of a kind of a phased approach like we saw in EP. Uh, each, prom, each province will go, you know, and do their implementation. So it'll take a few quarters, uh, a few quarters to implement here. But, uh, um, like I said, I don't think these are uh, different than what we see in other markets in terms of how we manage uh, the balance of our technology uh, and our access, uh, but I think China is still a, 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 a big opportunity of growth, uh, not just in uh, devices and diagnostics, but in adult nutrition and a pharma business. So uh, it's an important market for us, and uh, the team's doing a really good job of, at operating there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question will come from Robbie Marcus from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Congrats on a really nice quarter. Uh, Robert, I want to ask you uh, the, the overwhelming uh, topic of discussion the past few months has been GLP-1s and the possible uh, impact on the future uh, medtech market growth. You talked about it with respect to diabetes, but I'd love to just get your thoughts on a broader basis on GLP-1s, and do you see it as a negative, neutral, or positive uh, to your, your different end markets you participate in over the next five, 10 years? Thanks a lot. Sure, Robbie. Uh, obviously, this has, been, uh, <laughs> this has been a hot topic over the last couple of months. And let me just start off by saying with 20-plus you know, years of experience in diabetes, uh, I think every time new therapies, new technologies come to address this, uh, this disease and this, and this population, uh, I think it's all great. Uh, and these are great new medications that are going to have very positive effect. Uh, on the treatment of diabetes. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, investor angst here, Robbie, about you know, the potential impact of these drugs and what the, what's going to happen to different industries and, and different companies. I feel that the investor angst is, is probably driven more by those that have a little bit less domain knowledge in, in medtech, I would say, it seem to be moving a lot with like headlines or any new study or, 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 or publishment there uh, or, or publishing of any kind of study headlines, et cetera. So you've seen valuations in medtech, you know, significantly be impacted by the fear, like you said, about the reduction in these market sizes, whether it's going to happen in the next few years or it's going to happen in decades from now. And I guess my view there is that, you know, I understand that new technologies will will naturally cause us to think differently about the future. And I think early on, those initial thoughts about the future are, are, are generally impacted more by emotion than, than facts and data. And uh, I think that's what you're seeing right now uh, today as it relates to GLP-1 and, and, and medtech markets. Um, I think there's a, if you think about it long term here on, on the bigger picture, I, I think there's a fundamental mismatch here on you know, revenue and revenue forecasts uh, that we're seeing versus, you know, potential impact to patient and patient camps. You know, I've, I've looked at the consensus forecast for this class of drugs, you know, looking out four to five years here, you know, they, they seem to be in that 60 to $70 billion range, uh, which is pretty significant as a category. It's probably one of the largest categories I think we've ever we've ever seen. Uh, but then if you take the pricing, at least the public pricing that we've seen, uh, whether it's the U.S. pricing or the, or the lower international pricing, um, and you convert that into user bases and back into the numbers, I mean, we're looking at 10 to 15 million people in the next four to five years of, that will be on this drug. Uh, that's a real small fraction uh, of the size of these medical device markets uh, that we're talking about, right? There's about half a billion people with diabetes, uh, maybe another half a billion people that's got cardiovascular disease, and, and maybe, there's a, maybe there's an overlap of, you know, people with diabetes and cardiovascular, but still you're talking tens of millions of people with, you know, you know maybe a billion or under a billion people. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of a mismatch there in terms of how we're seeing this impact, equating the revenue uh, and the potential 
uh, growth of the revenue with you know the the, the patient pool TAM. So. Um, so that's one big area I would say. I think there's another question here of just about you know the question of coverage and uh, you know obviously these drugs have great uh, outcomes and great outcomes impact and then the question is what's the appropriate cost to achieve that uh, that uh, that, um, that that outcome? Uh, I've seen a lot of discussions and news stories about you know payers and what the payers are going to do and you know insurance companies and PBMs and, and pharmacy chains. Um, those aren't payers. Um, the real payers are the employee, uh, the employers, uh, and the companies that pay for these. And I think as you look at companies uh, and you know higher um, higher medical expense costs. Uh, inflation, um, I think that's going to be a factor as we go into next year also. So, uh, so I think that's, those, are, those are, I'd say, the, the, you know, the bigger aspect here on the long term. On the short term, though, uh, as you mentioned, um, on the diabetes, I actually see it as a positive impact uh, on the diabetes business. As I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, we completed an analysis recently that showed a significant number of, uh, of Libre users were on these drugs, and, and the data showed that those that are using both products are actually using more of those both products uh, when you compare them to, you know, to, other, uh, to other users. They, they tend to wear Libre sensors more often, and they tend to take their GLP-1 medication more frequently. And I think that's a great thing uh, because higher therapy compliance uh, ultimately is going to, you know, uh, improve uh, health outcomes. And, and that's not different, Ravi. You know, this, this complementary relationship, you, you know, MedSec very well. It's not uncommon to see that. Um, you know, medical device procedures, you have patients that are taking medications either before and, and after their procedure. And you see it in diabetes. Like I said, I've seen this in my 20 years where, uh, it's very common to use multiple tools in combination, whether it's insulin uh, and oral meds, whether it's you know, fast-acting insulin and long-acting insulin. And uh, so I, I think more treatment options here is a good thing for patients. Um, and uh, I think these drugs are a real nice addition to the mix. Um, I think as you go forward, though, I think there are some there are definitely some other areas of interest related to this topic that we're exploring. I think uh, one thing that uh, is clear to us as we've gone through this process is to really use the data uh, a little bit more to our advantage. Um, since the launch of Libre, uh, we've collected de-identified de de data uh, from the user base. I'd probably go as far as to say that we probably have the most robust glucose data set in the world. I think the last time I looked at it, we've got close to 50 billion hours of glucose monitoring data. So I think Libre is a perfect platform here to actually evaluate the effectiveness, um, you know, outside of a, of a more controlled trial, uh, look at it more in a real, real world setting. Uh, and there's just so many different ways you, we can look at the data, look at, you know, how the drugs work over time. Does one drug work better than the other? Uh, what kind of uh, job do they do in terms of a profile, um, in terms of time and range? So, again, I think we can do this on a population level. We can do this on an individual level. So I think that's going to be, a, a, I'd say, an important thing going forward for us here is to use that data set uh, to be able to kind of explore that. And i just finally say, uh, with a with the, with the portfolio with a diverse portfolio that Abbott has, where we look at healthcare across you know the full spectrum from nutrition to diagnostics to then treatment, I think that this then provides the company uh, with an opportunity uh, to further explore where we can bring value to patients that are using these drugs. I, mean, I think it's common knowledge here that there there are side effects, as there are side effects with with, with most drugs. Uh, and one of those being increased uh, loss of muscle mass. Um, I'd say uh, we have experience here in the, in the area of nutrition, um, and you know, losing that amount of muscle mass as a ratio is, is it can be problematic. So uh, we've got an opportunity here to be able to develop, you know, whether it's a nutritional product or other products that can help address, um, you know, one of these side effects, which is which is muscle mass uh, loss. So. Um, so there's good opportunities for there uh, for us also in the portfolio. So you know, 
bottom line, I think it's fantastic science. It's fantastic biology. Uh, this is great for public health in the short term. You know, I think the concerns are overblown, and, and I think in the long term, if, if you know, we want to look out 15, 20 years, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think there's still a lot of question marks there, given some of the facts that that, uh, that I've raised. So, really appreciate that, Robert. Maybe if I could sneak one more in on CGM, something that I think has really flown under the radar with the GLP-1 noise is you've recently gotten type 2 basal coverage in France, you have it in the U.S. and Japan as well. Just thinking about future opportunities in countries to approve type 2 basal, which could materially expand your reimbursed um, coverage opportunity around the world, how should we think about that and, and how do you size that opportunity over the next few years for Abbott? Thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, well, we had a really good quarter. Um, up 28%, international was up 26%. Uh, U.S. we continue to do pretty well in the you know plus 30% uh, range there. And uh, to your point, uh, we saw uh, a, a nice impact from that basal uh, coverage, uh, especially in the in the international markets, right? And it's nice to see the international growth uh, accelerate again. I remember last year there were question marks about our international growth, and a lot of our focus was on our upgrade strategy uh, for Libre 3. So getting the sales team now, reworking the demand generation, and, and a lot of that growth is, uh, as you pointed out, we're seeing nice growth from, um, from that basal segment, um, especially in France and Japan where we, where we got uh, uh, reimbursement, uh, differentiated reimbursement, uh, right? We've added about 150,000. Uh, I think that was the day that we reviewed uh, over the last 12 months uh, of basal users on, onto the user base. And, and if you look at that last 12 months, a larger portion of that 150,000 was happening towards the second half of that. So, so there's definitely acceleration ongoing there. Uh, I was actually surprised to see the, 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 the speed at the U.S. coverage. So right now about, I'd say, um, 90% of commercial payers uh, have now adopted uh, some level of basal, uh, basal coverage, so that's very positive. Uh, so both those three markets, U.S., Japan, and, and France, are doing very well uh, in terms of basal and basal coverage and providing uh, that kind of tailwind of growth. And again, there's a lot of good data to be able to support while that it benefits uh, these, 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 uh, these types of patients also. And we saw that in the, in the data that we presented uh, with the French, uh, with the French, uh, uh, with the French claims data. So, uh, so I'd say, yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's not something that's happened. We've been focusing on this, generating the clinical evidence, building the sales forces uh, to be able to reach a primary care team, investing in uh, direct consumer advertising uh, where we're allowed to do that. And uh, that's, a, that's a key growth driver here of, uh, of this target we have to reach $10 billion by, by 2028. I'd say that's, a, that's a, an important growth driver. It's not the only growth driver, but it's an important growth driver, and, it, and we've got a lot of good momentum there, Robbie. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next question will come from Danielle Antolfi from UBS. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for, for taking the question. Um, Robert, so just wanted to follow up on Josh's question earlier and appreciate you're not going to give 2024 guidance, but just at a high level, you know, there's a, there's a few puts and takes I can think of. You know, Robert, I, I appreciate the momentum in the underlying business, but you will have competition coming on the EP side, which has been a strong double-digit grower. You know, looking at MitraClip and a quarter of double-digit growth, that was great to see, like, how sustainable is that? And, you know, comps are just inherently potentially a little bit tougher. So if you could maybe walk through in a little bit more detail some of the puts and takes at a high level that we should consider, nutrition, tough comps there, um, you know, should consider as we think about 2024, that would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, you're I'm not sure we'll do a plan review here, but uh, I mean, there's a lot there. Uh, I'll, I'll try and touch on some of the topics there. I mean, I just go back to uh, we we have a growth model and a growth forecast that you know I'd say during the last two years has been masked a little bit by by COVID and the ups and downs of COVID testing, uh, but being able to sustain 
uh, high single-digit growth, double-digit growth in the bottom line. Um, that's what we've been doing uh, this year. Uh, a pretty significant double-digit bottom line because we, we forward invested back in, in 2022. So you look at our top-line growth right now, it, 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 we haven't had to put as much SG&A to be able to kind of support that growth this year. So, But the, the, the growth model of that high single-digit growth um, and, uh, and double-digit bottom line growth has is, is, is been happening uh, throughout uh, this pandemic with COVID testing. And, and uh, as, the, as the COVID testing numbers come down, you get to see that uh, a little bit more now. Um, so I feel good about uh, delivering that. Uh, in 2024, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a macro environment that's out there, but uh, as it relates to all the elements that are uh, that are directly in our control, uh, I feel very good about it. Uh, you know, your comment on electrophysiology, yeah, we'll have competition. We have competition today. Uh, we grew uh, in Europe. We grew mid-teens, uh, and we've been growing mid-teens for the first nine months with the competition that you refer to. So, um, so we feel good about our position there. Um, on MitraClip, uh, we've seen double-digit growth in MitraClip for the last three quarters. A uh, big driver of that has been international and, and growth international, and we're starting to see uh, a little bit now of a rebound uh, in, in U.S. U.S. was up 5% in MitraClip um, this quarter, and, and again, that's sequentially better from the previous quarter and sequentially better from the one before that. So, uh, and we've had competition uh, in that space also. We've had competition internationally, and we've had competition in the U.S. too. So, um, so I, I, again, uh, you referred to comps. Yeah, there's, uh, listen, I'm not going to deny there's some comps. Obviously, the, probably the biggest one there is nutrition uh, this year. Um, but, uh, you know, every year there's comps. Every year a company's got comps, and, and uh, I'd say if you were to remove some of those comps from our Q3, we'd still be growing double digits also. So, um, so again, I feel good about our high single-digit growth forecast. I feel good about our double-digit EPS growth. Um, we've got a lot to work with. Yeah, there's challenges, but we have a lot to work with. We've got a great pipeline of products that, we're gonna be, uh, that we've not only just launched, but that we're going to be launching also. So... Um, so, yeah, there's always puts and takes, uh, uh, Danielle, but uh, I think on the aggregate, if you look at the aggregate of our positions in these markets, uh, I think we're in a real strong position. Uh, that was super helpful. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Our next question will come from Joanne Wunsch from Citibank. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the question. Um, nutrition, it, it, your comments, if I remember them correctly, are that you are back in a leadership position in the nutrition of business. Are you back at 100%? Are you humming along? Do you feel like there's anything that's lagging or maybe ahead of the game? And I'm going to squeeze in um, your current thoughts on M&A, particularly given a lot of pullbacks and valuations. Thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, we never believed that we were going to recover all the share in, in you know, in, in a quarter, right? So the way the way this market works and the way we've kind of modeled it out is that we're showing, you know, uh, month by month kind of sequential um, sequential uh, increases in our market share. So if you look at the volume um, right now as measured by you know third party, we've now crossed over that uh, that leadership position. Uh, in the month of September, uh, we're not 100% back to where we were uh, before the recall, uh, but I, I always said that we would be there, you know, towards the end of the year. So uh, we're probably at about 90% back uh, to that initial, uh, to that pre-recall uh, market share, but it's nice to see uh, across all the segments here, uh, real nice sustained growth in our market share. Uh, and even if when you look at different segments of the IMF, uh, so if you look at the channels, WIC and non-WIC, uh, WIC, we've, we've been uh, a market leader uh, since the beginning of the year, and, and, and that was a result of our strategy uh, in the second half of last year to, 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 to stay focused on that underserved population. 
um, and uh, the non-WIC channel, we're seeing you know nice continuous month by month uh, gains uh, of market share. And I think the teams have done a, a real good job. Uh, I think we can all see that the shelves are, are, are pretty well replenished right now, um, and uh, now it's just about continuing to execute uh, on our demand generation. Um, and uh, I feel good about what the team's doing and, and recovering that market share. So, um, so that's gone pretty much to pretty much to pretty much to plan there. Um, and then, what was your other what was your other question? M and A, particularly given pullbacks and valuations. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, listen, we've completed three transactions over the last six months. Um, you know, we acquired CSI and in the process of integrating uh, that business. Uh, I think it's going to be a nice uh, addition to our vascular business and start to reposition that business to kind of more higher growth markets. Uh, this quarter, we announced the acquisition of Bigfoot. Um, and this is just going to be able to allow us to broaden our offerings with Libre and provide a nice opportunity uh, from a global perspective. Uh, and then also uh, an announcement on the EPD side to expand access to, to biosimilars. So, so we've been active um, and uh, we continue to be active. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, valuations have come down, um, you know, the same way they came down, let's say, post uh, post-pandemic in that 2022 time frame. It's a, it's a good opportunity. Uh, like I've said, I think sometimes, you know, companies need to, you know, understand if it's a, if it's a short term or, or if there's something more fundamental in that valuation. Um, but uh, we're in a uh, great strategic position uh, to be able to execute on our A&A strategy, which is really focused on, you know, can we add value to the asset um, and, um, you know, and is it, is it you know, fall into our, our strategic framework of areas that we want to invest in and growth in. And, you know, the ones that I, the ones that I highlighted here are, are strategic, uh, and we believe that we can add a lot of value to them. So uh, we've got plenty of capacity to, uh, to engage. And, um, you know, if there's a, the right opportunity that comes along uh, in this period, you know, we'll be ready. Uh, we'll be ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question will come from Vijay Kumar from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Uh, hi, Robert. Thanks for taking my question, and uh, congrats on the good print here. I had two questions. My first one is, uh, could you just uh, elaborate on this China VVP for diagnostics? How big is uh, Core Lab in China for you guys at this point in time? And I think I heard 20% would be impacted next year. Is the assumption the rest of Core Lab would be impacted in, in fiscal 25. Like, how do these contracts flow out? Because my understanding is uh, you will see volume gains. Uh, are those volumes enough to offset uh, price headwinds? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the way this is kind of working out, right? These, this was announced recently. Uh, I think proposals are due within the uh, within the provinces that are going to be uh, bidding um, VJ. I'd say in the next 30 days, right? And then there's like another 30 days, 30 to 60 days to uh, evaluate all the proposals. Uh, so I think that this is going to probably start, uh, I'd say late Q1 and into Q2. Um, right now, the list of assays that are on VBP equate to about 20% of the 20% of the market. Uh, so our, our annual sales are uh, in uh, in uh, in China are about a billion dollars. So, um, and then if you look at you know the specific assays, it's infectious disease. There's some there's some fertility assays there, et cetera. So uh, that's where uh, uh, the uh, that's where the VVP is kind of focused on. Uh, I haven't heard, and team hasn't heard about expanding that to other areas of uh, of um, other areas uh, of testing, such as oncology or, or or hormones or other areas like that. So, um, so right now, I'd say 
this is going to be uh, our focus in 2024. Uh, if there's volume upside to be gained, yeah, there could be volume upside to be gained. I mean, we do have good good market share uh, in, in some of these segments. Uh, in others, we have lower market share, so it presents us an opportunity. Um, so uh, I think in areas where you've got higher market share, you'll, you'll feel more price. Uh, and then if you can offset that price by gaining volume in segments that you've got lower share. Um, so uh, I, mean, I don't think that's uh, rocket science there. Um, and uh, we'll just have to see how that all plays out. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've had experience going VVP in, in, uh, in China. We, we've gone through it with stents. We've gone through it with, uh, with EP, uh, certain parts of our pharma business. Um, uh, certain parts in CRM also. So uh, team knows how to do this. They know how to kind of think about it uh, and, and manage it pretty well. We, we adjust some of our uh, our cost structures also as a result of that. So uh, I think the team's got a good formula here how to manage it, and we'll just have to see how this kind of plays out. That's helpful, Robert. And my second one, uh, I, I know you touched upon PFA. I think Abbott's launching their own PFA at some point in fiscal 25, 26, uh, how should we think in the interim, right? I think your peer had some pretty uh, robust assumptions for what percentage of procedures would be PFA. Uh, is Abbott concerned about share loss, you know, when, when you think about that medium-term uh, time frame? And are there offsets to it, right? When I, you know, you haven't touched upon lingo. I think previously you had said lingo could be as, as, as big as um, Libre. Where are we on the lingo launch? Yeah, um, so we'll have to see how what, what other companies report uh, to go to see if we're gaining or losing share right now. But I'd say, uh, you know, we still have got good, robust growth. I'd say as we look into 2024, um, you know, I'd expect us to grow generally in line with market, uh, which has historically been double digits. Uh, we've got some good innovation that's rolling out uh, on the RF side. Uh, and, you know, as – as we've spoken about uh, our EP business, um, you know, we talk about PFA, you know, that's going to be a product that's going to be really geared towards uh, AF ablations. You still have VT and SVT ablations where we do have good positions over there. Uh, a good portion of our sales are also on the mapping side and the mapping and the diagnostics and those consumables. Uh, so I see those being less impacted uh, also. So um, I'd say for, for 2024, um, we've got a good opportunity um, with, uh, with our AP portfolio to, you know, to be growing there in line with the market. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I think to the previous question, yeah, we've got plenty of uh, different shots on goal here to be able to deliver our high single-digit growth rates. Um, and we've got a very rich portfolio, and we're in exciting markets. Uh, yeah, Lingo uh, didn't touch on it because it wasn't asked, but uh, now that you have asked, uh, yeah, it, it is a great great growth opportunity for us. We're uh, launching it in uh, UK. I'd say I'd call it more of a controlled launch, VJ, to understand kind of the marketing mix, the marketing messaging, the positioning, the interpositioning with Libre, um, and uh, the learnings we've got are, are fantastic, uh, and I'm excited about uh, a full-on uh, launch in the U.K. Uh, starting next year. And then the opportunity to be able to bring that here to the U.S. I've been public about our intention to file lingo here in the U.S. by the end of the year, and I think that's going to provide another great opportunity for growth for us also. So. Understood. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question will come from Matt Mixick from Barclays. Your line is open. Hey, thanks so much for taking the questions um, and for all the great color uh, today. So I just thought maybe follow up on, on a couple of um, uh, pipeline opportunities and growth drivers, um, one being uh, Triluminate and Triclip, uh, sort of if you could maybe walk us through the expected pathway for commercialization in the U.S. Um, on that front. Uh, and then uh, back to diabetes, I know the, the you know, GLP-1 has dominated the, the discussion there, but um, with Tandem rolling out integration with their pump and kind of making wider availability here of closed-loop integration in Q4, um, just uh, be great to hear your thoughts on you know, what that ramp looks like, what additional support or efforts you expect will be required on your end, and 
just just what we can expect over the next you know 12 18 months is that that uh as that's out there and available to patients thanks sure uh on your question on triclip um yeah so we submitted to the fda uh for review early this year it's my understanding that cms is going to review this in parallel also uh i think i i think i made comment to this uh last time um uh, we'll likely see a, a panel uh, review here and I, and I don't think it's uh, unexpected to be quite honest with you a lot of the novel therapies uh, go through an advisory panel process, saw it with TAVR, saw it with MitraClip. Um, so I expect uh, that to be the case here for, uh, for, uh, for TriClip. Uh, right now, the expectation of that panel is, um, you know, uh, I said the, 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 the date that we, uh, we think we have right now is January. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, how that, uh, that occurs. Uh, but again, I don't, uh, you know, the fact that the, we'll probably go through a panel, I, 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 I still feel very uh, enthusiastic and confident about uh, the opportunity that we have with TriClip. Not only this is, uh, these are patients that are in real rough shape um, and there's not a lot of treatment options. And, um, you know, we've shown in the Triluminate study that we can uh, reduce uh, TR and, um, you know, our, our, our understanding and our belief is that, uh, you know, re reduction of TR is important um, and, uh, and, and we'll be going through that. And then I'd say, you know, the safety profile of, of, of the TriClip product uh, is very important uh, as you think about, you know, building a new category and, and a new area. But, you know, you got five million people here, uh, uh, Matt, that suffer from TR globally. Uh, I believe this is a, a billion plus opportunity uh, for sure and uh, we're committed to uh, we're committed to building um, a, a real strong position on here with innovation on the product and uh, and strong clinical evidence to support it. Uh, your what was your other question? Sorry. Um, uh, uh, sure. So close with integration with tandem and, and maybe the ramp or expectations for that that process. Uh, yeah, uh, it's my understanding here that we'll see a launch uh, uh, sometime uh, by the end of this year uh, with Tandem, um, and uh, you know we're excited about that. There's about 150 to 200,000 you know new new pump users globally, so I think this is a, an area that we've uh, historically haven't been a player in, uh, and now that and, and now we will be a player in. Um, we've launched uh, a a, a, a close. Uh, uh, an AID system in Europe, um, let's say more towards the end of last year and into this year, and uh, I was reviewing the results, the results of the team. I mean, that, that, that pump company has had tremendous uh, kind of growth uh, partnering with us, uh, and uh, so, so that's a, a, a proof point there that when you, you bring in the choice and the option uh, and you put it together with Libre that uh, there's a real strong value proposition to connecting uh, the pump with, uh, with Libre. Um, and then, you know, as I've said, uh, we want to be a leader in this space, not just be a, a competitor. Uh, so there's a lot of work ongoing right now with our dual, uh, dual analyte glucose ketone uh, sensor, which we believe uh, there's a lot of applications there, Matt, but I think one of the uh, clear uh, applications and value propositions is to be able to kind of pair that with uh, with an insulin pump and have a, a, a much more richer uh, algorithm uh, and safety algorithm in, in the uh, uh, in the insulin delivery um, system. So, uh, so we feel good about that. Operator okay. will take Thanks, uh, one more question, please. Thank you. And our last question will come from Jason Bedford from Raymond James. Your line is open. Good morning. Thanks for uh, squeezing me in. Just a couple quick ones. First, what is the uh, updated expectation for COVID testing revenue here in, in 23? And then second one, Robert, you alluded to gross margin expansion in 24. C can you just frame the, the sources of gross margin? I, I assume nutrition is a, is a key driver there. And then maybe just bigger picture, and I appreciate that everyone in the industry is facing these challenges, but is there visibility into clawing back to pre-COVID uh, gross margin levels? Thanks. Sure. 
Uh, yeah, there's visibility. Uh, I mean, if the visibility is in the first half of uh, 2024, then, uh, then then I'd say no. But we do have a plan uh, to be able to kind of drive uh, gross margin and gross margin expansion. I'd say as you look at it into next year, uh, Jason, there's really a couple elements here that uh, will be uh, will be tailwinds for us. I'd say uh, lower commodity costs, uh, that for sure, and uh, you know those were pretty big headwinds for us uh, in uh, I'd say in 2022 and 2023. Uh, on one end, you've got commodity costs uh, in nutrition, but you also got other commodity costs that are impacting you know the entire company. And uh, what we have seen, and I think a lot of companies have seen this, is those uh, those commodity costs. Uh, start to bend and, and, and move down uh, the, the other way. So, and uh, and that'll that'll be particularly important for us uh, as as we think about nutrition, uh, which is highly dependent on uh, on, on a large number of commodity uh, and commodity inputs. Uh, seeing a lower freight and distribution, uh, and again, I think a lot of companies are seeing that. But we're seeing that not only just in terms of rates, but also with 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 more normalized supply chains. Uh, we can use different modalities of freight that can also lower costs and, and not using air all the time. Uh, so that's going to help. Um, we've got, a, uh, I think, a pretty robust process and teams in place that uh, work on gross margin and gross margin improvement plans. They've been very busy, I'd say, over the last 12, 18 months. Uh, I expect those teams to continue to deliver uh, on their strategies to deliver cost reductions. And then favorable product, uh, product and portfolio mix, right? So as our, as our faster growing, higher margin businesses and new products become a large portion of our, of our overall sales and sales mix, I think that also contributes to that. So, um, yeah, we, we understand that uh, gross margin is, 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 is key to be able to deliver on that double-digit bottom line uh, EPS growth. And, um, you know, we're, uh, this is something that we work on every year, and I think we've got a little bit more of a, a, a better environment for our teams, uh, for our teams to, to, to work on. So uh, on, your, on your COVID question, I'll, I'll ask Phil to, to, to give you the details there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jason, relative to uh, 2023 COVID testing sales forecast, uh, full year is about $1.5 billion here. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just wrap up here um, with a few comments. It's clear that we're seeing broad-based uh, growth a, a, across the entire company. Um, as I said in my comments, we've now delivered double-digit organic sales growth here uh, for the past three quarters and uh, forecasting that type of growth again. Uh, this next quarter, EPS contributions and the growth in the base business has increased every quarter, and we've exceeded the uh, expectations we've set for the uh, initial uh, guidance of the year. Uh, the pipeline, you know, to some of the points that were made there, a big kind of opportunity for us going into 2024 is our pipeline, and it continues to be productive with several new product approvals, indications, reimbursement, and geographic expansions there. So momentum is clearly building, and... Uh, well positioned for a strong end of the year and going into 2024. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up and thank you for joining us. Thank you, operator, and thank you all for your questions. This now concludes Abbott's conference call. A webcast replay of this call will be available after 11 a.m. Central Time today on Abbott's Investor Relations website at abbottinvestor.com. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Everyone, have a wonderful day.